Thank you, Ruth, uh, for asking me to speak today. Um, what I hope to show you uh, over the next 45 minutes is just sort of the highlights of Parkinson's. And, and it's different than advocacy where you have to pick one thing to concentrate on. I think that in Parkinson's research, that, that is actually is, is, is an error. And if you pick the one thing and it turns out that you were wrong in that picking the one thing or the one cause of Parkinson's, then you're not going to get any, anywhere with, uh, or it's going to take a long time to get anywhere. And so I hope to show you that there are a huge number of venues that are possible to, uh, to explore in Parkinson's. And uh, the, uh, that we're attacking Parkinson's from multiple different fronts. So I'm going to highlight some of the strategies that are being uh, explored to treat Parkinson's disease. I'm going to talk about some of the reasoning why you need researchers who have uh, different talents. I'm going to talk a little bit about what our local research effort is uh, here in Ottawa. And then I'm going to talk just a little bit about what are the treatment options that are uh, going to be coming uh, to the market very soon for Parkinson's. This is a slide that I borrowed from my new colleague, Dr. Schlossmacher, and uh, the first quote is from Dr. Hornikevich, who is the original uh, uh, investigator who discovered that uh, Parkinson's is mainly a dopamine-related problem. And he said, I don't know what causes Parkinson's disease. There are 100 hypotheses out there of which 99 are wrong. So there are a lot of different things and a lot of different uh, uh, ways we can look at Parkinson's. The other one is from Michael J. Fox. Uh, this is uh, presented uh, at the World Parkinson Congress uh, earlier this year, and he said, business as usual is not good enough. I still cannot tie my tie any faster, and my gait is not any better, despite the millions that the NIH and our organization has put into research. And I think it's a little bit facetious in, in that um, we have made progress in Parkinson's, and there are a lot of things that are being developed in Parkinson's, and I think people with Parkinson's are doing better than they were even 10 years ago. We, that being said, we still have a long way to go, and we, there's uh, still a lot of people who are having a lot of problems with Parkinson's. This is a slide um, just trying to show you that uh, in the research realm, over the last few years, we're becoming increasingly uh, it's becoming increasingly evident that Parkinson's isn't just the tremor, stiffness, and slowness that we talk about, and there are definitely a lot of other symptoms that uh, a lot of research is being focused on trying to deal with these other symptoms. If you look at Parkinson's disease, and this is a slide you'll see a couple times as I, as I try and progress through to explain uh, some of the complexities, and I apologize already, or right up front, that uh, some of the slides are very complicated um, because Parkinson's is complicated. And so this is just a simple slide of trying to show the brain in two sections. So this bottom section is cut, if you see this little cartoon at the top, right at the top part of your brain. And so this is an area called the midbrain. And these are where the dopamine cells are sitting, uh, or the main dopamine cells that are sitting that are dying off uh, in Parkinson's uh, patients. The other is a section sort of cut this way, and it actually shows where the projections are going up into the brain. One of the things is, is that there are lots of other cells that are going wrong in Parkinson's, and the research that's being done is trying to look at these other cells that are going uh, wrong in people with Parkinson's. So there's lots of other neurotransmitters that are involved, and uh, there are different treatment options that people are trying to explore to address those other cell uh, and other neurotransmitter problems. So this is a, a, another way of looking at it. And um, so this is the normal side over here with this dark pigment here being the dopamine cells. And in somebody with Parkinson's, these cells are being lost. And therefore, the projections up into the higher parts of the brain are being affected. And the loss of those cells and the loss of these cells are involved in the control of movement. And therefore, this is what brings out the main motor symptoms. The bottom part of the slide just shows that the other feature that we look for to make a definitive diagnosis of Parkinson's is the Lewy body. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about how synuclein uh, fits into the picture. And this is actually one of the proteins that we now recognize through the genetic aspects of studying Parkinson's goes wrong. And this protein actually accumulates in Lewy body. So this is just a fancy stain showing a Lewy body. My very first uh, slide 
that wasn't outer space, that was uh, a Louis body stained in a different way to show uh, um, the highlights of different makeup of, of what a Louis body is. We are making progress. There are now, we have many different treatment options for trying to improve the symptoms of Parkinson's. If you look at this list, there's five of these medications that are listed here that weren't available 10 years ago. So we're definitely making progress. The most recent of them is Resagiline that I think a lot of you have heard about. And uh, this is a medication that's just come to the market in the last basically three or four weeks. Um, and it is a, a nice addition to our current armamentarium that we're hoping to see uh, grow. Most of you are aware of the surgical treatments that have been proven to help. Unfortunately, um, the, the surgical uh, treatments require very strict inclusion criteria, and you're going to hear about that, I think, later on this afternoon. And uh, so from a, these operations are unfortunately only viable or only really applicable to a, a minority of people with Parkinson's, but they definitely play a, a big role and definitely help the people who, uh, who they can be used for. So why do we need more research? Um, we definitely need better ways to diagnose Parkinson's. We need, definitely need better ways to follow the progression. And this comes back to how we do some of our clinical studies. And for people with Parkinson's, it's not a very satisfactory answer when they come to see me and, and I tell them that they have Parkinson's, that they basically have to believe me. Um, and there's not a test that I can do to sort of prove it to them. And, and Parkinson's remains a clinical diagnosis. And because of that, I'm not right 100% of the time. And, and so that causes some difficulties with the clinical trials and the clinical research that we do. And then we definitely need better ways to follow the progression. Instead of me just testing your rigidity and your tremor and things, we need more objective ways to follow the progression so we can more accurately uh, define whether treatments that we're trying are working or not working. And so we need more work in this area. As you're aware, there really, unfortunately, right now are no treatments that can even slow the progression of Parkinson's. We're hoping that uh, we're making some progress on this, and there are a number of ongoing trials looking at different treatment options and trying to prove that some of the options that we have right now might have an effect on disease progression. And even with that, we definitely still need better treatments that, to help the symptoms of Parkinson's. And so this, again, is another avenue that's being explored. So I think you need to take a step backwards before you can come up with better treatment options. You better understand what you're trying to treat. And so why do the brain cells in people with Parkinson's, why do they die? And the bottom line is we don't know. There are many different theories. Some hold uh, more evidence than others. I think from an infection standpoint, uh, this is something that has been talked about on and off. There's really not really any good hard evidence that Parkinson's is caused by an infection. Immune system problems, again, people are looking at that, but not a lot of great evidence to say that, that, that your immune system plays a big role in causing Parkinson's. For probably at least 40 years, we've been looking for environmental toxins, and we still think that there might be something in the environment, but we actually really haven't been able to identify anything that a specific toxin that you're likely to be exposed to. Been talked about for a long time, this excess generation of free radicals, and, and so that there are different processes that happen within your body and in your cells, and, and one of them might be you develop these free radicals, and these are bad for cells and cause cells to die, and that is something that is being looked at in Parkinson research. <coughs> energy failure in cells. Well, it makes sense that if the cell is trying to produce energy and needs energy to survive, that if, if the cells run out of energy, they're going to die. And so is some of the machinery in the cell, is it uh, losing its energy, and basically the battery runs out, and so the cell dies? And there is evidence for this. What about the factors? I mean, all cells need different influences to stay alive. And for Parkinson's, maybe these dopamine cells are losing some of the normal stimulation that they need to stay alive. How about there are programs in our body that are required for cells to die? And if you think about it, I mean, you need cells to die in your body. The lining of your stomach constantly gets turned over. Your skin constantly gets turned over. And, and if the cells don't die, that causes problems, skin cancer and things like that. 
And what happens, and there is evidence that in Parkinson's disease, that switch that tells the cell to die gets turned on uh, much sooner than you want it to, and, and that may play a role in causing Parkinson's. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the genetic aspects of Parkinson's, and this is uh, one of my areas of interest. And there definitely are genes that people carry that have, that have abnormalities in them, and that what triggers their, their Parkinson's. This is a, a complicated slide on purpose, and just trying to show that it's not going to be a simple answer that these pathways are not simply, this is the one pathway that causes Parkinson's. These pathways are happening within a cell, they're, they're interconnected, and um, is there gonna be one major pathway that causes the problem? Maybe. I suspect, though, it's gonna be a, a, a convolution of things that go wrong in the cell, and so that you have these interaction in, between different processes. It's still believed that there's an overriding, probably environmental insult or some sort of environmental process that maybe triggers these pathways, and maybe that's tied into some sort of genetic predisposition. So why did you get it versus your neighbor? Why did you get it versus your brother or sister? And that probably plays some role. So is there any hope? I mean, this is a complicated process. Is there any hope of making progress in this very complicated process? I think you need to have two things. You need definitely to have basic research to understand the process, and you need clinical research to actually try and figure out what's actually happening in patients themselves. Again, a complicated slide to again try to highlight this is a complicated process. If you look at what are the leading theories in Parkinson's, probably oxidative stress, the mitochondria, so these are the energy producing parts of cells, and so these are the batteries of the cells. There is good evidence that, that there's a problem with these. If you look at this excitotoxicity, so this is generating these free radicals, and this is another theory uh, that has a lot of evidence behind it. And then inflammation is an area in Parkinson's that over the last few years is gaining ground in terms of there's an, you know, just like if you cut yourself, there's an inflammation response that happens to try and heal. If that inflammation response is abnormal, it can cause problems with the cell. If you look at all of these different processes, investigators are trying to come up with a whole host of different uh, compounds that are trying to block those processes. And again, it's a very complicated thing, and there's many different compounds that potentially can be tested. And on the uh, right-hand uh, slide, on the right-hand side of the slide, um, just showing that um, there are many different avenues that we can look at. The other part is that these different processes can cause problems with the, the cell's ability to handle proteins and get rid of proteins, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And these can eventually cause problems with the cell, and then the cell finally decides, okay, I've had enough, and commits suicide, basically, and, and kills itself, and, and how much of a role that might play. So what I did was I tried to break it down into sort of four broad categories, and th this is by no means a uh, complete. And so what I said, okay, let's look at just very briefly some of the drugs that maybe interfere with the basic process and where that is coming from. I'm going to talk just a little bit about how different trophic factors, so these are stimulating factors that researchers are looking at to try and help uh, the Parkinson brain. Talk a little bit about cell transplantation and then talk a little bit about where we are with gene therapy. So if you look at Parkinson's in, uh, in this year, um, we know that there are at least five different genes that cause Parkinson's, and this is all work that's only come out in the last 10 years, and some of these genes, this one called LLR, LRRK2, has only been discovered in the last two years, that we know that those are involved in causing Parkinson's. So let's figure out what those genes do, and there's a huge amount of research going into trying to figure out what these genes do, and if we know that they cause Parkinson's, how, how can we identify and, and, and come up with pathways to potentially block this process? This is uh, a slide with alpha-synuclein. So this across the top, uh, this figure A, is a, a cartoon of the gene. And here is the two of the different kinds of problems that the gene, uh, that happens in this gene. And if you cause, the, if these mutations are there, what happens, and this is in the lower part of this diagram, is that normally what happens is this gene, when it makes its protein, it kind of folds itself up, 
and then it kind of floats around the cell and it does its thing. We're still not sure exactly what its thing is that it's supposed to be doing, but we do know that if these mutations occur in this gene, that what happens is now the proteins start clumping together. So instead of floating around nicely in the cell, they clump together. And they start clumping together, then they start clumping together more and more and more. And what happens is they form big clumps, and these clumps are actually Lewy bodies. And so the main protein we now know in a Lewy body is alpha-synuclein. So what researchers are doing is say, okay, we have an idea now of a process that's happening in the cell that causes it to die. Maybe we can try and interfere with that process. And what researchers are doing is they're developing and testing compounds that actually stop these uh, clumping from happening. And it's a neat uh, project, and I was going to actually steal one of my nurse's slides, but didn't wind up uh, including it, to show that if, if we start from ground zero with a drug, it can take more than 10 years, even if it looks like it's very promising and work, to actually get it to the market. So what researchers are doing, they say, okay, well, there's thousands of compounds that are already on the market that are being used for all different kinds of medical problems, where they're already in people, people are taking them, and they are safe. So instead of spending the 10 years to make sure that something is safe, let's test all those drugs and see if maybe they have a, a role to play in interfering with this protein clearance problem that these cells have. And it turns out that there are a couple of strong leads uh, of some um, drugs that we're hoping that we could try in people. And um, these uh, are generated from understanding the process and then using uh, basically a cell culture to show that these drugs can, can enhance or interfere with the process. And this is uh, one avenue of research that's being looked at. How about the other? This is the second gene that was discovered. So this gene is called Parkin. And it's a very common cause of Parkinson's if your Parkinson's starts before the age of 20. So most of you, uh, that wouldn't occur. So this is a rare form of Parkinson's. But very simplistically, what happens is that this gene, it turns out, is involved in the process that actually tries to get rid of proteins. So it's an enzyme, and this enzyme's job is to try and tag the proteins. So if you think of a, the, your cell accumulates garbage, you put it in the garbage bag, you put a twist tie on. So the job of this, uh, of this gene is to put the twist tie on, so then you know to take it out to the curb and get rid of it. And so what happens is, is that people who carry this gene defect, you don't get the twist tie on and so the garbage doesn't go out, and so the cell starts to accumulate lots of extra protein in it, and that then gums up the whole machinery of the cell. So what researchers are looking at, and this is what my new colleague, Dr. Schlossmacher, is looking at, is, well, let's test known drugs that actually might enhance this process. So let's get more twist ties onto the cell, onto these uh, proteins to make sure then the cell can get rid of them. And so this is a, another very exciting avenue of research that's being explored. Cannot look, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, so how about the second part? So where are we with trophic factors in Parkinson's research? So. The, probably the leading one that's been most studied is, is one called GDNF, glial-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, the way it works and the idea behind this is, okay, we know these cells are down deep in the brain. We know that th these are the dopamine-producing cells, and we know if we put more growth factors around there, maybe that'll stimulate the growth of the cells, and then the cells will survive better. The difficulty and the immediate problem is that these cells are deep in the brain and the surgeons really don't want to put a needle into that part of the brain because there's too many other things running by there that they're going to run into trouble. So from a practical standpoint, you can't put a needle down in that part of the brain. Um, and so what they do is they say, well, how about we try putting the growth factor, uh, the second part, if we can get my mouse to come here, the second part, let's put the needle up higher in the brain, that's relatively more safe. And let's hope that this growth factor then sends its signal down to the, to the cell body, and uh, hopefully that'll work in terms of uh, helping save the cells. This is a, a slide from, an ex from experiments done now six years ago. And so this is not a new idea. And what this is, these are monkey brains. And what, this, what they've done to the monkey was they actually chemically induced a Parkinson's. So they gave the, gave the, the monkey Parkinson's, and so this is the normal side of the monkey brain, 
And this is the deep structure down in the, in the brain, the midbrain. And on this side, you can see there's less yellow. So that's the side of the brain that's been affected by giving this toxic insult to these monkeys. What the researchers then did is on this B panel here, they actually gave them an infusion of this GDNF, glial derived neurotrophic factor. And you can see that now the cells, there's a lot more yellow there. And so that's the dopamine cells. And so it seems like it has worked. And so the cells have gone from what should have been after the toxic insult like this, now there's lots of cells sitting there. And so in a monkey, they've been able to get it to work. Unfortunately, um, for these kinds of experiments, people aren't monkeys, and researchers have had a hard time trying to get enough of these growth factors into the right part of the brain uh, to have an effect. Again, it's in turn, it's in part a delivery problem. So people have, and researchers have tried to, let's, let's send this, your brains are, are bathed in fluid, and the fluid floats all around your brain. So the idea was, well, let's just stick it into the fluid. So we don't have to disrupt the brain cells too much. We'll stick it into the fluid, and we'll hopefully this growth factor will float around enough, and that'll help. Well, researchers tried that, and that didn't work, and it had actually a, a lot of side effects to it, and so they, they stopped doing that. And then they decided, well, okay, let's try to inject it just like we did in the monkeys. And there was a, a lot of excitement a couple of years ago because they'd had an open label study. And what this means is that the patient knows what's happening and the doctor knows what's happening. And the difficulty, and you have to be very careful when you're reading about Parkinson research and research in general, what kind of study it was. Because if the person who's getting the treatment knows what they're getting, and if the researcher knows what they're getting, everybody's hopeful that it's gonna work. And we know that by doing that, at least 30% of people, just giving them a sugar pill, it will work. And this really causes a lot of trouble with, with doing um, a lot of the different surgical treatments for Parkinson's, is that there's a lot of hope that they're gonna work, and then we run into trouble that it was probably just a placebo effect. So the initial study was done with five people, and it looked like it worked. So then they said, okay, well, let's do it so that the doctor doesn't know what's going on, and nobody does this intentionally, but the doctor doesn't know what's going on, the patient doesn't know what's going on, and let's try this infusion. And again, there was a lot of hope that this was gonna work and get these growth factors to where they were supposed to go, but when we did it in a blinded fashion, it actually turned out that it, it doesn't work. And so these growth factors and these infusions of growth factors are taking a little bit of a step backwards in terms of we need to go back and think about this technique a little bit more. How about cell transplantation? This is something that uh, most people have heard quite a bit about, and that's because cell transplantation is not new. Um, we've been doing these, these kinds of uh, experiments for well, more than 20 years. And where we are, and in summarizing 20 years where they work in one slide, the adrenal cell transplants, uh, again, there were, I'm sure, hundreds of people who got these um, in the 1980s. And the idea is your adrenal cell produces dopamine. Let's take out somebody's, some of these dopamine cells in the adrenal gland. Let's put them up in the brain where there's, we need more dopamine. And uh, it seemed like it was working. So a lot of people all over the world got these, uh, got transplants from their adrenal glands up to their brains in an open label fashion. And everybody was reporting that these were all working well and everybody seemed to be doing better. The doctors were happy, the patients were happy. Unfortunately, then when you looked at it more critically and more scientifically, it turns out that there was just a placebo effect from everybody wanting and hoping that we were doing a good thing. The next was fetal cell transplants, and this has created a lot of, uh, a lot of buzz, especially in the United States, and uh, it continues to uh, be ongoing um, with uh, the ethical uh, uh, problem of using fetuses to transplant. But, and again, there were lots of patients throughout the world who got these transplants in an open fashion, meaning everybody knew what was going on and everybody felt better. So let's, let's keep doing it. The trouble is, is that it really wasn't the surgery that was making the difference. And then when the researchers sat down and actually did a true blinded study, it actually turns out that it didn't work. And so people were unnecessarily having these surgeries done. And again, so we've taken a bit of a step backwards. Researchers have tried to get more uh, fancy and say, well, if there's an ethical problem with fetal cells, let's, let's use other dopamine cells from other places. And, and one, of the, one of them actually turned out they were trying pig cells. And again, it didn't work. This sort of ties into the discussion of stem cells. 
And I think for a lot of researchers around the world that, that stem cells um, uh, politically is, is very charged. And again, a, a lot of uh, excitement in the last couple of weeks around Michael J. Fox and his uh, support of stem cells. But I think we have to be very careful that we're thinking of using stem cells in the right way. Um, if we're just going to use stem cells to make more and transplant stem cells to make dopamine in the brain, we've had lots of experience to say that's probably not going to work unless there's something else magical about a stem cell other than it producing dopamine. Is it going to sit in, this, in the brain better, connect better? So there's lots of problems with that. However, one of the nice things about stem cells is stem cells you can, the idea is, is, is take a cell and a stem cell actually is a cell that and we have them actually throughout our body, is it can turn into anything. So with the right factors, you can get a stem cell to turn into anything. So it can be a bone marrow cell, it can be a heart cell, it can be a brain cell. And maybe if we can genetically, or if we can manipulate a stem cell to actually do something different, maybe not just make dopamine, but maybe make, uh, a, make it stronger, make it uh, produce a growth factor that then uh, could have an effect in, 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 in a Parkinsonian brain. And so I think that's where stem cell research is going. However, although there's lots of discussion about it, stem cell research is still very much in its infancy in terms of being a real practical solution for people with Parkinson's. It's a very hot topic to talk about, but we're, we're still quite a ways from, from that being applicable uh, in, in people. And how about the last part? So gene therapy. Um, gene therapy, again, is one of the sexy things to talk about in, in the research realm and in uh, very much being talked about in Parkinson's. And I'd just like to highlight two different uh, compounds that have just actually, a, a few weeks ago, there was abstracts presented at a, a big neuroscience meeting uh, where people, uh, two presenters, had presented their work. And what the idea behind this is, is let's focus the treatment somewhere else. And one of the treatments is actually directed at some cells deep in the brain. And you're going to hear more about this this afternoon because this is where the surgeons go after with this deep brain surgery, so the subthalamic nucleus. It seats way down deep in the brain, and the surgeons have to be very good to get way down there without causing problems. Um, but what the idea is is to use a virus, and maybe the virus can help uh, manipulate the cells in the area so that people get better. So there is, in this area of the brain, so the subthalamic nucleus, the surgeons, what they do is they actually stop those cells from firing. And, and what they've done, if one of the centers in the States, they actually hooked this gene, this uh, um, GAD, it's a, it's a kind of a gene, they hook it to a virus. And what its role is actually to stop the cells from overworking. And this is one of the, this is one of the cell groups in the brain that actually is overworking in people with Parkinson's. And they had 12 people that they actually did this in. They, they, they hooked a virus with this particular gene and they injected it deep down into the brain. And that 25% of people, uh, there was a 25% improvement in these 12 people who had this surgery done. Again, a word of caution is that this was an open label study. So everybody knew what was going on. And so if to show that this is a true effect, uh, the, the surgeons do need to go back and say, okay, in a blinded way, is this something really having uh, an effect? The other one is this nurturin uh, uh, compound, and this uh, produces a natural protein that your brains have, and this is a, a protein that helps brain cells survive. And so the researchers have actually taken this knowledge, hooked this gene into a virus, you inject the virus into the brain, and then you get the virus actually to integrate into the normal brain cells. And the idea is that the virus will, um, uh, will, will deliver more of this growth factor into the brain, and that that's going to help people with Parkinson's. And again, they just reported these results in an abstract uh, a few weeks ago, and they had 12 people who they'd done this experiment with, and so this is, is being done in, in people with Parkinson's, and they showed a 40% improvement at nine months. So very exciting results uh, of a very novel way of trying to treat Parkinson's, but again, uh, just a word of caution that this is an open-label study, and so that uh, it definitely needs uh, more research. So before you all start flying down to the centers that are doing this, again, it's, it's very initial um, uh, studies that were done. So I'd like to say this is me jumping on my wakeboard, but I can't do that. So this is my son, uh, just my jumping to a new topic. Uh, 
slide transition. <laughs> so this is, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about our, our Parkinson Research Consortium here in Ottawa. And what we did was we tried to get uh, local researchers in Parkinson's interested in Parkinson's uh, itself. And so we wanted to bring together a, a group of scientists to help understand the basic cell processes that happen. We wanted to get the scientists and the clinicians talking more so that there's a better bridge between what was happening. And our idea um, is to actually get researchers across Canada to talk more to each other. And, and this is something that in Canada we have a, uh, a nice uh, position in that we have a relatively small population and a relatively few number of, of, of groups. And so the idea is, is can we get a more cohesive uh, research plan together on a more national basis? Oh, I'll skip on here. Um, so in Ottawa, we have a number of different researchers uh, from all different aspects. And I, and I tried to show you over the last sort of half an hour, 45 minutes, is that these researchers, we need researchers with many different talents. Um, we need researchers who can know how to manipulate viruses. We need researchers who can manipulate different cell processes. And so we have researchers who have these different talents. So these researchers, you know, we have experts in genetics, we have experts in viruses, we need models to study Parkinson's, we do have experts in stem cells, and we need to know, we need to have uh, clinicians who know how to test some of these uh, uh, processes. One of the things is, is that it, that we've struggled with in Parkinson research is, is you need to have models. We can't run around and grab people off the street and say, here, we're going to inject you with this. We're not sure what it does, and we think it's okay. Um, but uh, so, so we need models of Parkinson's, and it's interesting that, that our group has a number of different models, because there's no one perfect Parkinson model. So we have a worm model, we have a fly model, we have a fish model, and we have mouse models of Parkinson's. And the idea is to, to what we learn from one model, we can apply it to other models, and then hopefully to people. Where are we? We're, we're fairly new. We've only been at this for a couple of years in terms of trying to bring uh, researchers together. We've been uh, very fortunate that our local society, the Parkinson Society of Ottawa, has been very, uh, very generous with giving us funds to, to get our uh, research, uh, researchers, researchers together. Our local Kiwanis has been very helpful in, in, uh, in raising funds for us. Our investigators themselves hold grants from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the NIH in the States, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the Parkinson Society of Canada. So we do have granting, uh, our, our researchers have grants from all different uh, sources. We've uh, measured success by, you know, how much are you being able to publish and we, we are now generating papers uh, uh, describing our literature so other researchers can know what we're doing. And in doing this, and in trying to build a group locally here in Ottawa, we have been able to attract researchers from south of the border to come north of the border, and I'm very happy, and I think a lot of you have heard about our new recruit, Dr. Schlossmacher, who's actually come from Harvard. So if you can build a, a core group of people who know what, uh, a core group of people, you can get more people interested in what you're doing. So we've actually, he's the first uh, Canadian research chair position that's being given out for Parkinson's research. So we're very proud of that. And he's a clinician as well as a scientist. And so he's going to, he's going to uh, be studying uh, cell processes within the lab. And he's also going to be seeing patients. He's involved in actually trying to measure that protein, alpha-synuclein. He's actually trying to come up with a way of, of, uh, of following, diagnosing Parkinson's and a way of potentially following Parkinson's progression. And he's actually, I think, probably flying back from Japan, uh, like Dr. Stossel was last night, uh, uh, where he presented some of his results. Uh, he's looking at trying to understand gene function, and he's trying to use this understanding to come up with better treatment options. I'm involved in, in doing some of the, the, the study of genes in Parkinson's, and I showed this slide earlier. So there's a lot of different genes that are being discovered five definite ones uh, that we think are, are, are causative of Parkinson's. What I've been doing is actually screening uh, for these genes in people that I've collected samples from. So we, we have over 200 people that we have blood samples on who have Parkinson's. And in our hands, the, this, this most recent gene, I wouldn't be running out anyone here uh, because in our Canadian population, it doesn't seem like this is a very, gonna be a very common cause of Parkinson's. 
There's reports that come out of different genes potentially being involved in Parkinson's, and this is one that we picked up on because it was in, they found a, a group of researchers from California happened to find a, what they thought was a mutation in a French Canadian individual, so we thought, well, we've got lots of French Canadians here in Ottawa and in Montreal, so we thought, well, we'd test our patient population and we couldn't find anybody, so I think it casts some doubt that this is a real finding. Another gene that's come up is this NUR1 gene, and we were able to find one individual who, who has this. And again, this is helpful because now what we've done is we've, we've identified this specific gene defect, and what we're trying to do now is take that, what we've learned from the clinical uh, setting, and say, okay, well, what is the specific gene defect? So we've handed this off to one of our other researchers who's now stuck this gene defect into a cell, into a neuron, and he's studying, well, why did this person get their Parkinson's if they had this one change happening, and so this is where we're, uh, we're going with this. Um, and then this is, this is what I've been studying for now many years, is a big family with Parkinson's and trying to, to discover a novel gene that causes Parkinson's again. So well, then we can bring this into the laboratory and say, okay, well, what's the process that's going wrong? This is uh, me getting to work, another transition slide. Um, so that we're trying to push forward with um, understanding Parkinson's research and at times doesn't seem like we're getting very far, but in fact we are. And again, trying to stress that you, have, you need to have better basic research to come up with better treatment options and, and we are making success with that. So what's coming to the market? Well, Stilevo is a combination medication that's available now in the United States. It, uh, and we uh, think it's probably going to be coming to the market uh, next year. Rotigotine is, is a way of actually giving uh, Parkinson medication through a patch. And so we've actually been studying this particular compound for now three or four years in the clinic, and, and now it is actually coming to market. And so it's going to be a way of giving a, um, a dopamine uh, medication through the skin. There are different uh, formulations that are coming to the market. So Parcopa is something that's available again in the United States. They don't always get the drugs first. Um, but uh, so this is a, just a rapidly dissolving form of levodopa. So you just put it in your tongue and it dissolves quickly. Another one is Duodopa, is uh, for people who have very complicated fluctuations with their Parkinson's. One of the things we struggle with is actually trying to give people a very continuous infusion of their medications and so they don't have to fluctuate and have good times and bad times related to their medication. That sounds like an easy thing to do, but it's turned out to be more than a 20 year struggle with coming up with ways of delivering the medication on a more continuous basis. But this is a particular compound that will probably be coming, we think, to the Canadian market uh, this coming summer. And then this other one, uh, this KW6002, is in very late stages of development, and it actually is one of the first medications that's going to be coming to market that works in a very different way in the brain. And so it actually works on an adenosine receptor in the brain. So there's nothing on the market that does that at this point in time, and the hope is that it will help with fluctuations and not cause more extra dyskinesias in people. So that'll be a nice, a nice addition when it comes. What's potentially coming to the market is, I've sort of alluded that there are a lot of different pathways involved in Parkinson's, and there's a lot of drugs and a lot of compounds that are being tested on all these different pathways. This is just a partial list of some of the things that are in later stages of development. So drugs look, looking at uh, improving the dopamine system in the brain. So there are different dopamine agonists that are being developed. There's different catecholamine O-methyl transferases that are being developed. There's uh, drugs that are being looked at enhancing glutamine or glutamate within the brain. Again, another neurochemical that's involved in Parkinson's. And manipulating this neurochemical, we hope, will improve various aspects, including the dyskinesias of people with Parkinson's. Adenosine, I've, I've mentioned one already, but there's a number of other ones that are in development and so if having an effect on these adenos this adenosine chemical in the brain, we're hoping is going to play a, a role in helping people with Parkinson's. And then serotonin is another medication, and some of you may have heard this related to some of the antidepressants. Those have an effect on, they're mostly working on uh, the serotonin system, and so there are Parkinson drugs being developed that we hope will have a, a multitude of effects in people with Parkinson's. 
how to get these um, medications to the market, the only way to do that is to eventually try them in people. So you need to do clinical studies in uh, Parkinson's to know whether these drugs are going to work. And so these, for those of you who have been involved in clinical trials, you realize this is not an easy task. These are very involved. We do everything we can to make sure these, the things that we're trying in people are absolutely as safe as we can possibly make them. And um, it's, it's a complicated process. And part of the difficulty is when things get complicated, they also get very expensive. And so the pharmaceutical uh, industry has been the main uh, drivers of uh, developing new compounds. And they spend a lot of money trying to, to, to come up with new compounds. And their companies, so their job is to make money. So in the end, unfortunately, it costs so much to get these drugs uh, to the market that they wind up being expensive. Um, and that's just the, the, uh, the way things uh, work. It's, 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 it's a very complicated process. And so in Ottawa, we're, we're involved in testing uh, many of these upcoming uh, drugs to try and get them to the market again so we have uh, better treatment options. And then I just wanted to finish this uh, quote from Leonardo da Vinci. So medicines will be used when the doctor understands their nature, what man is, what life is, and what constitution and health are. Know these well, and you will know their opposites. You will then know how well to devise a remedy. And I think that's very applicable to where we are now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Grimes has agreed to take a few questions at the end of the session, so we, we have about 10 minutes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it is the, the question is about uh, stem cells, and, and can we use uh, other ways of generating stem cells in people with Parkinson's? And, and certainly that's the nice thing about stem cells, is that if you can get a stem cell from a different source, so you don't have to use a fetal stem cell, you're much better off. Unfortunately, the, the fetal stem cells, because they're less mature, um, that they've been easier for the scientists to manipulate and work with. And that's why this whole fetal uh, stem cell stuff has, has, has come, come about. The hope is, though, that we can learn how to manipulate the adult stem cells better, and therefore the whole issue of using fetuses is, is, is mute. And I think that that's definitely where the research is going, and, and, the, and the researchers who are involved in, in stem cell research are getting to the point where it's you're not going to have to use fetuses. They can manipulate the adult stem cells well enough that, that, that you, you can get around all the ethical dilemmas of, of using fetuses. Other questions? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, the, the, so are there other examples where if you, you're, you're looking at drugs from different areas um, that have gone on to be successful in, diff in treating different conditions? And there are a lot of drugs that are on the market that the researchers were developing them for one reason, and in the end, they were successful in a completely different uh, avenue. And this has happened, this is part of medicine, and, and um, there's lots of drugs that get used. I mean, I use different tremor drugs, and they're, they're actually blood pressure drugs, and they actually help tremor. Um, there's uh, epilepsy drugs that, that are designed to help epilepsy, and they work for, let's say, tremor. I think the best example is actually uh, Viagra, is that Viagra was not developed to help uh, impotence. Viagra is actually developed to be an anti-hypertensive drug. And one of the side effects uh, in the clinical studies <laughs> was that it helped uh, with uh, help with erections, and so it um, it, it uh, turned out that it, it actually works great. And I guess the company that developed Viagra is making lots of money, um, but it was it really it was more of a fluke that it, uh, 
that th this kind of thing happens. So there's definitely lots of examples. So the question is, is related to fluctuations and have researchers looked at, at different, I think, ways of trying to measure fluctuations and um, there's been lots of studies where we, we, you know, we give, we, people are, are hooked up and they get blood samples drawn, you know, some of them were even every half an hour after they get an, an injection of, let's say, levodopa and they can measure those levels that, that occur and we know that the levels fluctuate in the blood. The difficulty is, is what is actually happening in the brain and, and, how, and how are these levels that are fluctuating in the blood, how are they affecting what's happening in the brain? And this is where we, we start to lose uh, understanding. Um, definitely we would like to have um, a blood test that can help us monitor what we're doing when we give a drug. Um, uh, it would be ideal if, let's say, in early Parkinson's, uh, we have a drug X and, and, and we could measure in the blood that drug X does this. And then six months later, we do another blood sample and we can see that now drug X has caused this level to drop. And uh, this is in part what, uh, again, my collaborator, Dr. Schlossmacher, is doing and that he's trying to develop blood markers of Parkinson's and can they be involved in following progression or different aspects of, of Parkinson's. And so it's, it's a very attractive way and, and researchers are really trying hard to come up with sort of blood markers. Um, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has been very, uh, very supportive of this research and, and, and they've been very good at trying to direct research. So they'll say, okay, we're gonna generate, we have $10 million Every researcher around the world come up with an idea of let's look at who's gonna who has the best ideas for biomarkers and that's what this is really what these what these are and they say okay we're gonna give you a bunch of money if you can develop a good biomarker and and this is this is one of the directions that the Michael J Fox Foundation has taken over the last three years um, but we're unfortunately not there yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I think this is, you know, I started with Michael J. Fox's quote that he, he basically can't do anything better than he used to be able to do despite his, his he's been very, uh, very successful in, in raising money and, and they've contributed, I think, $80 million now in, in the Parkinson research. And I, I, what I tried to show was that, yes, we have setbacks and, and yes, we've had, uh, not had as much success as anybody would like. Um, but we're definitely making progress and, and we definitely are getting drugs to the market. We're definitely uh, making progress and, and, and a better understanding and, and through a better understanding coming out with uh, better options. One of the difficulties we have is uh, tried to sort of show is, is that there are, you know, there's probably, you know, at least 25 very good candidates to, that we, we test and, and look good in all the sort of basic models that we can test in the laboratory. And one of the difficulties we come up with is, well, how do we prioritize in testing in people which ones are the best ones? You don't wanna, you don't wanna come up with, okay, here's the top 25 and just by bad luck, it's the 25th one and you've tried all 24 first. 
So, you, you know, you definitely want to try and say, okay, really, what is the best uh, that we can, best options? Your other question was urban, urban and, and, and rural, and, and, and certainly in, in the epidemiologists have spent a lot of time in terms of trying to figure out different uh, backgrounds. If you're a miner, if you grew up on a farm, and are those are those risk factors for developing Parkinson's? And yeah, there has been work showing that, uh, and, and repeated studies have shown that you know if you grew up on a farm in Canada or in the United States and you drank well water, that your chance of developing Parkinson's is higher. It's not a lot higher, but it's definitely higher than the general population. So is there something there? If you look at the research that's done out of China, actually in China, it's the opposite. So if you actually grew up in a big city in China, you actually have a higher chance of developing Parkinson's than if you grew up in a rural area. And from some of the colleagues that I've had who uh, have lived in China, he says, well, you, China in the cities is very polluted. And, and so is there something more toxic in their cities that's causing Parkinson's? Again, we haven't been able to come up with what is that toxic thing that may be increasing that risk, but certainly people are looking at it. Well, people have looked, you know, could, and this, this ties into, there's been a couple of studies that have uh, work done uh, in Vancouver as to uh, are there health professional risks. I'd say a lot of people don't, don't believe, or don't buy into that, that avenue of research, um, that there are risk, prof you know, potential, and that ties, I think, more into the infection part of, of Parkinson's, and, and, and I think that that's still not, not well shown. Yes? Yeah, I mean, Azelect, it's again, it's, it's, a, um, it's a drug that has been well studied. It's had huge um, uh, amount of clinical work to go into trying to understand where it would fit in, in the treatment armamentarium people with Parkinson's. And it's a neat kind of drug in that it's pro there's sort of two different populations that I think it's, it's potentially useful in. So people who first developed their Parkinson's, it has been shown in very well bl double blind studies, meaning that the researchers don't know what's going on, the, the patient doesn't know what's going on, and, and, and really testing in a very scientific way and to show that people with early Parkinson's, it helps their symptoms. So it, it makes the tremor better, it makes the stiffness better. So that's one, one avenue. The second is that it's also been shown, again, in very well done uh, clinical research that for people who are having wearing off of their medications, that it, uh, will help in wearing off. So those are the two indications that it's being uh, brought to market for. Um, there are ongoing studies that some of you may be involved in with it in terms of the other question with it, is it neuroprotective? Uh, might it have an effect on not only helping symptoms, but also actually slowing down the disease process? Obviously, I mean, that, that would be ideal. Here, take this pill, it will help your symptoms and it will also uh, make your symptoms progress less quickly. That's still something that needs to be answered before I think we can really uh, say for sure. But it, it's going to be a nice, a nice drug to potentially help. You know, you have to be careful with any new drug, and you have to be very much aware of what the potential side effects are of it as well. And so you have to use it with caution. So not everybody uh, is going to be appropriate for it. Answer it. Are we out of time? He wants to do one more. <laughs> I'll get the hook soon. Referring to your slide of the iceberg, I wonder if it's kind of quit referring to Parkinson's as a movement disorder. Come up with that term that uh, better describes the other aspect of it. Uh, it's, it's a very good question, and, and it was a, there was a um, um, one of the um, uh, prominent investigators. Uh, uh, Dr. Langston out of California at the World Parkinson Congress uh, was trying to uh, propose that, that we do uh, change what we call Parkinson's because it isn't just a movement disorder, it is uh, other things 
um, as well, and it causes lots of other problems. And and so that this is uh, there's definitely been a move in the last few years of all the sort of non-motor problems that people with Parkinson's have, and I think. It's important as a as a doctor that we, we, we recognize and, and know how to treat those other things better than I think we, we recognize and, and are treating now.